Hey everyone, it's Mike Andes and you're listening to the Business Bootcamp Podcast. Today, I am going to be talking about why the nine to five has been so demonized and in my opinion is absolutely leading to people to get into business and start entrepreneurship and leading many people to having a lot of problems when they don't get their success as quickly as they thought. Before we get into this show though, a big thank you to today's sponsor, which is Gusto. If you haven't already, go to gusto.com slash bootcamp. Try their software completely free where you can pay your employees. They have an app where they can see the breakdown of everything that's been taken out of their paycheck and like taxes and all the rest of it. Check it out today. Go to gusto.com slash bootcamp. All right, so I'm going to be drawing this graph. And I am doing this after a weekend of talking to two different young entrepreneurs, both under the age of 22, that were either about to give up or completely mentally drained because of what they had been feeding on when it came to the online guru business success space. And so I'm gonna go ahead and share a couple things. And I made this graph with one of them and I wanna share it with you, okay? So this is again is inspired by some people calling it slavery to be an employee pressing everyone that they should go start their own business. And in my opinion, causing a lot of damage to the young entrepreneurs in the community. So let me go ahead and draw this graph out. This is going to be a graph of the money that someone would make if they were an employee versus if they were an owner. Okay. And I'm going to prove that if you're going to go the business ownership route and becoming an entrepreneur, you better be ready to be very patient in your quest to make a bunch of money. All right. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have this as five different years. So one, two, three, four, five. Now I'm in the landscape industry. I talk with a lot of landscapers. So I'm going to kind of use what I see a lot of times happening for our landscaping business owners, whether it be our franchisees or people that I talk to, I'm going to show the trajectory of income, profitability, and what I see so often happening when it comes to the first five years in business. So, all right, we're at year one, we're year two, your three, your four, and your five, okay? This is what I see happen from a business ownership standpoint. I usually see them starting to lose money in the first year because they're growing. And then what happens is they slowly start to make more money, a lot of times like this, looking at something like that, okay? This is gonna be, on the y-axis, is gonna be dollars, like how much money they're making, okay? On the y-axis. On the x-axis, we have years of time, okay? Now, that is the business owner's route. I'm now going to track what a, an employee might look like. What they're probably going to look like is something like this. A little bit of a slower growth pattern. Maybe something like that. They're you know doing a nine to five. They're following the corporate ladder, maybe being a, gen, a manager, maybe being in a corporate position, etc. Now, I'm going to track what happens to these two individuals over the course of five years? All right, so year number one, right here, we're going to assume that this person at this junction is gonna make $50,000 in revenue. In year number two, the owner is gonna make negative $100,000 because they're investing into their business. So after a year, they put $100,000 into the business buying, you know, for example, in a lawn care landscape industry, maybe bought trucks, they hired people, they did advertising, they did a whole bunch of stuff to set their business up, $100,000, they're in the hole. So that's like this whole first year. And then if we drew this, this would be like 50 grand, all right? This is not to scale, this is just to make a point. All right, then year number two happens, okay? So we're going to assume in year number two that we still lost money for the business. So now we're at negative $110,000. So we lost $10,000 more. So we're doing this as a net. So we lost $100,000 the first year, we lost $10,000 the next year, which puts us at a total of a, a negative 110,000. Now the employee on the other hand, let's say they got a, a $10,000 raise, they're now making $60,000 a year. So now as a total, they are now they actually are up $110,000. Okay? Negative $110,000 for the business owner, a, a net total of $110,000 positive cash flow for the employee. Okay, again, we're talking about this whole year right here. All right, year number three happens. This is now when the owner, the, the business usually starts to do well, especially in the landscape industry. Year three is always when I see the business owner start to really feel confident. They start to figure things out. They've got hiring down. Their marketing's intact. They've actually started figuring out their systems. Year number three, they, they do $50,000 in profit. Bottom line, take home pay, $50,000 in profit. Now their total is negative 60K. So 110, we were down before. We made a positive in year three of $50,000. Again, this is not to scale, but negative $60,000 of the new total for this business owner. 
All right. For the employee, they made another, uh, they, they increased their, you know, they, they're working a corporate job. They got a raise. They made $70,000 in year number three. And so now they're at a total of $180,000 net total. 80 to 50. Then they got, they got a raise to 60 and now a raise to 70. They made $180,000 as a combined total so far. Now we're at negative 60. All right, year number four happens. Now the business owner is doing good. They're starting to really roll, very profitable. They're going to bring home $100,000 in take-home pay, which means as if we add everything up, they're now at $40,000. If you add all of this up, they're at positive of $40,000. Whereas we're talking now about the employee, they get another raise. Now they went from $80,000 uh, so we went from $70,000. Now they're making $80,000 per year. And so now at year number four, so we're here, right here, uh, they are going to make, they're going to make $80,000. $80,000 on top of 180 is going to be $260,000. All right. So again, we're, we're adding this up. This is all cumulative. All right. So they got 50,000 first year, 60, 70. Now they made $80,000. They made a combined of $260,000 for the entire for years. All right, year number five. This is where we're going to do our last analysis here. Now the the the, the employer, the, the business owner, is really rolling. They figured things out. They're bringing one hundred and fifty thousand dollars take home pay from their business. So now, if we add one hundred fifty thousand to this forty thousand, we have one hundred and ninety thousand dollars that this owner has collected over the course of five years. Which, by the way, if you divide this out, they literally made less than forty thousand dollars per year. Uh, and not, doesn't sound so hot. Doesn't sound like the cool flashy thing that you should be doing. Doesn't sound like the thing that you're going to be on the beach doing absolutely nothing tomorrow with a click of a button, one drop shipping click away, one click funnel away. Like this is a bunch of nonsense, but that's what's portrayed right now on social media is entrepreneurship. So we looked at this, this, uh, fifth year for the business owner and they were at a whopping $190,000 total because they brought home 150000 dollars in the fifth year. Now this employee, on the other hand, they got a raise to $90,000. Okay. So again, we're in year number five here. The employee though, they made $90,000. They got another raise. Their total is going to be $350,000. They are up $350,000 while the business owner over the course of the first five years is up $190,000. Now, we're, yes, we are talking about from a cash flow standpoint, you can make a really good argument that, hey, the business owner is creating equity in their business by putting all of this owner's investment into the business. All of that's true. However, what the problem is, is that we begin to think that we're going to have all of this money as a business owner. We're going to get in this business. We're going to grow. We're going to make a million dollar business. I talk to people every single day that talk to me and say, I want to build a million dollar lawn care business. I want to build a million dollar landscaping business. In the back of my mind, it's like, do you know how hard that is? That literally just six or 7% of the businesses in America do over a million dollars in annual revenue. And we have the audacity just to roll it off of our tongue as if it's just going to happen because we've somehow thought because of social media, because of all these people with this money and showing off their success and flaunting what their image of success is with their Lamborghini and their big house. We figure that, oh, it's so easy. It's so simple. And, and because they've told me I can do it from sitting at my house, doing absolutely nothing without any experience, without any risk. And then they actually start a business and they realize, oh, I lost $100,000 the first year. Oh, and by the way, you number two, still losing money. I'm growing top line revenue growth, maybe. It's not until year three I'm actually profitable. Like I have to wait three years. I have to wait four years till I'm even out of the hole of my, like from a cash flow standpoint. Most people do not have the patience to be able to withstand this as a business owner. And the other thing is this, that gets me so sick and tired of when people say that being an employee is like a slave and like you, like you just go into the nine to five working for the man. Are you crazy? Look how long it's going to take for this business owner to recoup what the employee makes. Oh, and by the way, this job down here where you're losing money for several years, it's not nine to five. It's 24 seven, 365 with a whole bunch of risk. And when you're working, you're not getting paid back here. You're actually losing money the bigger you make the business. That really plays with people's heads because we're starting to train young entrepreneurs and new business owners that tomorrow you can make money. That without much work, without much effort, without long nights, without long weekends of working and hustling and grinding and sacrificing for your business, that you're just going to make money. 
and you're just going to become a millionaire. And it is so simple and so easy. And bu building a seven-figure business is just like one click away and one little product you can get on Amazon, just sell it, and you can be in the Caribbean while it's just selling and you do absolutely nothing. It just keeps like printing money. Are you crazy? Do you really think that's what entrepreneurship is? Do you really think there's really any shortcuts in business? In my opinion, there is no shortcuts in business. There is no shortcutting this route. You might be able to do it faster, but everybody, no matter how successful they are in business, came through this route. They started in the really hard times, the times it wasn't fun, the times there wasn't cameras falling around with them, the times there wasn't interviews, the times they lost sleep, the time they lost money, the time they lost friends and family and employees, and they felt like they were going to completely have to give up. Every single person had to go through that time. If anybody is selling you on a shortcut around this period of the entrepreneurial journey, they are trying to sell you something. If they're trying to say you can start up here somewhere overnight, tomorrow, within a couple of days, if they're trying to say that you don't have to go through the pain that everyone else, everyone else that's built a seven figure business, everyone else that has built a company that lasts for generations, decades, ge time after technology evolving, changing, anyone that's gone down that road has had to go through this time of awakening. The time when as an entrepreneur, you feel alone. It's not glamorous. It's not fun knocking on doors, asking people to cut their grass. That's not the time when everyone's like watching you and making a video about you and you're just having those social media following. That's not the part that we're watching. And yet we get so fixated on this part of the journey. We get impatient because this part of the journey is not fun. It's not the part that we get excited about. It's the time when all of a sudden this looks really, really in, like inviting. It looks very, very comfortable to be able to go to your job and make a paycheck and work nine to five and leave and have to be okay with that. And like, there's no one else calling you in the middle of that. There's not risk that you can lose your house. There's not risk that potentially if the business doesn't work out that you're going to go bankrupt and you're going to be embarrassed in front of everyone for seven years and your credit score that you had a failure. That's the part that people don't like. I talk to people every single day in the lawn care and landscaping community, but they constantly want to be over here. That's what they want to be. They dream about the six, the seven, the eight figure business. And they forget that every single one, every single great landscaper, every single great business owner has had to go through this a year, two years, sometimes three years of painful, agonist type of grinding and work to actually set up yourself for this kind of parabolic growth. And yes, this is the problem. All the attention on social media and the people that have the talent, the money, the charisma to share off their lifestyle, they're the people up here, but we all forget about the ones down here. And maybe you're listening to this now and you want to be up here and you're discouraged because you look and say, man, I could have got a job. I could have be working nine to five right now. Why am I doing this grind, this hustle thing? Maybe you're an employee working crazy hours, but you're doing it because you know, one day it's going to set you up for something really awesome down the road. Trust me, put in the work now. Anything that's trying to sell you a day, a week, that you can just do it overnight, that's going to be easy somehow, and you can just do it by just, just click this, buy this course, and everything will become fine for you. People buy landscape business course sometimes, and I have to tell them, this is not a quick fix. This is not like, oh, you're just going to make a bunch of money and build a $100,000 per month business. That's not overnight. If you look at the course, it says three years. It's a track of the first three years of your business to get to that level. This is not a, a quick fix. Everyone wants the one webinar, the one book, the one course that's going to just fix everything for them, the one click funnel, the one product, the one little thing, that just, the, the one penny stock that's going to go to the moon, the, the one game stock that's going to make them a millionaire. And we chase after these things and waste our livelihood, waste our imagination. And in my opinion, as I close this thought up, it leads to a lot of short-term thinking. Because guess what happens when you're down here in years one and two and losing money, but your business is growing, but you are literally losing cash flow. But now you're getting discouraged because you don't have enough cash to do marketing. Now you do have to, you have to go door to door. Now you have to get scrappy due to some guerrilla marketing. Now you've got to be, you're calling people trying to get them to hire because you know, the stimulus check is keeping everyone at home right now. And you've got to get desperate to grow your business. That's not fun. That is not the glamorous part of being, uh, whether it be an owner or there be someone that is a general manager position where you are tr tr trying constantly to grow the business. And it just seems like, you know, you don't make any more money in the short term by working all night. 
You don't make any more money by pulling a 15, 16 hour day at the office. This guy gets to leave. This guy gets to go home. And that's not bad. Not everyone is cut out for this. This is a big problem. When we demonize this, we force people to start doing this, going, taking the high risk route of being an entrepreneur, and it literally will break people in their minds. Not everyone should do this. Not everyone can do this. And they're no less of a human being by choosing this top route. This person might need to have a family, have dependents that they need to provide for. They can't handle the stress of having two or three years of losing money while their business is growing. I think we've got to really take a really a step back at what entrepreneurship means for young people who are mentally not able to take the pressure of taking the step when they're comparing themselves against their friends who are on this linear track when it comes to employment. I don't think we should be demonizing this track either because this is a great way to gar grow your business, get a lot of skills without the financial hardship and stress that comes in the first three years of owning a business. So if anyone wants to call it slavery, to be an employee in a business that's doing really well and that you can get a lot of skills for, you should really go, you know, maybe disassociate with them. I don't care if they're a Ty Lopez of the internet. I don't care who, they're, who you're listening to. If they're trying to convince you that this is somehow a poor track to get on, then you have to start a business. And when, by the way, it's not going to be here. You're going to start here tomorrow. They're trying to sell you something. All right. Hope that was helpful for someone. It might have been just for one or two, maybe younger people, 17, 18. Maybe the people that I'm talking to are the ones that when I finished college and was looking to start a business, I was looking and looking on YouTube and on social media and seeing all this other stuff. And if you're in that position, realize if you're choosing the entrepreneurial route, it's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. There are no shortcuts. If you want to become an employee, it's not slavery. It's not some horrible thing. You're not somehow of a less class person. You're not giving up on your dreams. That's a bunch of garbage. You're the good company you can learn skills for. And then maybe down here you start your business, but now you're starting from here and you actually have a much better chance of success because you've been set up financially and not have to go through the turmoils of figuring out things on your own. I'm Mike Andes, Business Bootcamp Podcast. Let's jump into the questions. I know we have a, different, a bit of a different episode today, a bit of a different live stream. Um, but, uh, I think it's important. I, I've been like the past weekend, I dealt with one, two, two different, uh, young people, one that had been, has been going for about a year and is not seeing what their results that they wanted. They had a lot of setbacks. It's not easy to go, you know, get, go back into the trenches. You know, you run out of money now. You've had a lot of setbacks with COVID and all the rest of it. Now it's time to go knock on doors. It's starting time to get scrappy. That's not fun. No one, no one's following you around. No one was following me around. I didn't have cameras and a studio and a bunch of people like cheering me on back when I was borrowing money for payroll, really concerned that we weren't going to be able to make it, really considering going and getting a job at Amazon when they offered it to me the second time. That was a real thing. That was a real thing. Um, and I, I talked to one, that one, I said, look, you've got to grind. You got, it's not fun. It's not exciting to go knock on doors. I get it. It's not fun. But this is the time you've got to grind, all right? The other person was literally having a mental breakdown because he was comparing himself to all these people that consider themselves so successful and that it's supposed to be like overnight and he's been in the game for like six months. That's not entrepreneurship. It's not small business ownership. It's tough, all right? Let's go ahead and pull up some questions. Thanks everyone for hopping on. Just signed up with Gusto. So far, so good. Easy process. I would highly recommend. Thanks, Josiah. In other videos, you have recommended you hire when you're two weeks booked. My question is, does this rule apply to your first employee? I am 16 days booked, but still feels early to hire my first. So this is what I would recommend, Clean Green. So let me go ahead and write this up on the board. It's kind of an illustration of some of the stuff I've said before. So this is what, how we train our franchisees. You book, book yourself out two weeks, and then you go hire someone, or you reduce your marketing so you don't get as many leads. Because you start becoming inefficient when you're saying, book yourself out seven, eight weeks and leads are not accepting the jobs that you give them or the estimates you give them simply do the fact that you can't get the work done in time. So what we do is we look at two weeks out and then this is how it works. So this is today, day, boom, here we go. Okay, two weeks is here. And let's say that you have booked out jobs you know, for yourself. We're gonna talk about your first employee here. You booked out for two weeks. Okay, now this is what I recommend you do. You go hire someone and this person is going to start right here. This could be your first employee. This could be your third or fourth employee. It doesn't really matter. 
you're going to hire them today. You're going to say, hey, your first, your start date, your start date, when you, your first day of work is going to be right here. Okay. Now what that means is you filled your schedule for the next two weeks. Now, as we go into the spring rush and you know you're going to be accelerating how much work you're going to be getting, what you start doing, you have two weeks to fill this person's schedule and your schedule. All right. That's what I like. The two weeks of the fire under your belly to go sell enough work to fill both of your schedule. That's what I like. So two weeks from the day that have the start date. From that date on, you're now going to be booking for two people instead of one. So instead of getting one cleanup a day in, maybe you get two now. But that gives you two weeks to catch up, maybe spend some marketing dollars to generate the lead necessary. But as we head into the spring rush, when you know there's momentum, you can do this. You might not want to do this in October or November, even if you are two weeks booked out with leaf cleanups because you know you have a winter coming up and this isn't going to be possible. But as we go into the spring rush, this is the way you want to grow. Book yourself out for two weeks with maybe you have three employees, right? You have three employees and you're booked out like this, okay? I would still use the same methodology, all right? Now we're going to hire our fourth person and we're going to start booking from two weeks from the day because guess what? If you, if you hire a really good employee, they probably have another job. They probably need to give their two weeks notice. So if you hire them today, they got to start here anyways. That gives you two weeks though to actually make sure you have enough work on the schedule. Usually only applies to your first few employees because once you get like 10, 15 employees, you know, one employee, give or take, doesn't really make a big difference. You're always trying to hire good people. The one click away comment was golden. Not too many want to work hard and risk it. Adrian, watching from Austin, Texas. I'm following pretty easily. Just so you know, numbers, numbers, numbers. Dallas, Tulsa, Epic, Journey. What people don't understand is how much time it takes to run a business. If you do the math, the business owner usually makes less. There was a study. Um, the average entrepreneur makes about $70,000 a year. Like, it's good money. I'm not saying that's like poverty or anything. But the average entrepreneur, if you take the average, is like $70,000 a year. And yes, if you break down how much you're working per hour, <laughs> you're probably making less than a lot of your employees for the first like 10 years of business. Okay, because if you take the fact that you literally can sometimes work 16, 20 hours a day, um, like last night, I was rolling out the software for our franchisees. That took me most of the night. Um, didn't get paid any more today because of it, right? So it's a lot of hours, and you're exactly right. Long care juggernaut, welcome. Long care juggernaut, I need to watch some of your videos. I haven't. I apologize. A lot of people say I need to, and they say I need to interview you. So one, maybe one of these days, uh, I, need to, I need to do that. You have the best, lawn, best business advice in the YouTube lawn and landscaping world. Thanks, brother. What's the best advertising method you would say? I've addressed this in some other videos. I think it's a moving target right now. There's several platforms, including, including Google, Facebook, YouTube, Nextdoor, uh, Google Local Services. Those are all platforms we're really interested in right now. Great video, Mike. I currently bought our fourth truck and our first ramp rack today. Also a $6,000 repair on a truck. Gotta love entrepreneurship. <laughs> Very cool. By the way, everyone should follow me on TikTok. We are trying to take our, taking our TikTok-ness to the next level. Yesterday I had a video that did 300,000 views. I was very impressed. Lots of hate though about trailer setup. So definitely check it out. If you are on TikTok, you're going to want to see that. We're trying to post two or three videos there a day. College student lawn care. Hey Mike, we're going to year two. We did $400 our first week last year and did $4,000 our first week this year. Thanks so much for all the advice. Love your business course. Thanks brother. appreciate it. Adrian Castillo. I'm 32 and looking to start my own business next year. I'm slowly building up my equipment inventory and clientele. I look forward to walking around and talking with folks to build my own business. Thanks for your knowledge. No question, just simply taking it all in. Yeah, like a lot of people do not want to do the walking around, knocking on doors, talking to people, doing door hangers. It's not fun. It's not glamorous, but honestly, it's the lowest cost. If you were talking about customer acquisition costs, like customer acquisition costs, that's CAC. Some people will say, call this CAC. That stands for customer acquisition costs. You know, maybe if anything under hundred dollars, I'm pretty happy about for a recurring mowing customer. I'm super happy, but guess what? If I'm doing door hangers and walking around, maybe I buy like a thousand door hangers for, I don't know, $50 max. Uh, literally if I get two customers, my customer acquisition costs would be all of $25. And that's if I did a thousand door hangers and knocked on all their doors and only got two people. So. I really believe that by knocking on the door and talking to people, your conversion on door hangers goes dramatically through the roof and you can do a lot better than this number. 
So customer acquisition costs, my goodness, if you don't have a lot of money and you want to do marketing and grow your lawn care business, go knock on doors. Is it fun? Is it glamorous? No. Does everyone cheer for you? No. Does everyone make YouTube videos and like hype videos, 30 seconds of you like dang, going up to the lawn? Like, th like th that's not happening. It's a lot of like, I get it. It's a, it's, you know, you're afraid you don't want to, you feel like you're annoying people. We have two owners and two trucks. We are booked out three weeks and are splitting up the job between both of us each day. Do you recommend we hire one or two full-time guys or part-time? I, I really comes down to how fast you want to grow. If you want to go hyper growth, use this model. If you're booked out three weeks, go higher. If you book out yourself again, you're like still booked out with that other new person, hire again. Again, you're going into the momentum part of the season, the spring rush. So you know that the leads are going to keep coming and you can keep growing that way. That being said, uh, I really believe if you're young, take the risk, go hire someone, right? If you have work coming and you're just overwhelmed with work, go hire somebody. Um, and you say, well, what if I can't, can't fill their schedule? Well, then it's going to put the fire underneath you to go put some door hangers out, go knock on some doors. And I'm okay with that, especially when you're young. Double Brewski, if you had to start all over and had to start a lawn care business, but it couldn't be lawn care or landscaping, what would it be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've said this before, if I was just getting started and it was, I was back there, I didn't have the experience that I've had the past little while. Um, I would definitely go still into service-based businesses and doing stuff that people do not want to do. Septics, cleaning, all roofing, like stuff that no one wants to do. I want to go in there and I'd try to take the part that is very difficult, the labor, and make it ultra efficient. That's what we're trying to do with P4P. But I think like every industry you can do that and you're going to have job security if you're doing things people do not want to do themselves. Kirk Zandler, Mike, you mentioned turning down a job at Amazon. What was your thought process? So when I was in my MBA program, like Microsoft, Boeing, and Amazon all have their headquarters like an hour, hour and a half from the, the university. And literally, if you wanted a job from the MBA program, you were set up, right? And it wasn't like just me. Like everyone in our class could basically get uh, a degree. This is, we're talking now these two, seven, six, like six, five, six years ago, right? So like they're, all those companies are just booming and they're in Seattle. And so, yeah, great pay packages, um, compensation packages, all the rest of it. Um, I just knew that I was leaving medicine because I didn't want to be stuck in something for the next 40 years. And I wasn't about to leave my MBA and where I'd started with Augusta to go and do the same thing, get the, start the corporate ladder, right? But I was very self-aware of the fact that like I was the guy willing to go dig you know, for a couple of years and get dirty, but I needed to have that like maximum upside potential. And I did not need or want the security part. Um, so that's no, like there's plenty of my people in my, in my class that took the jobs and are doing great today. They're doing really good. Some of them, uh, in like in those, those companies, Amazon, Microsoft and Boeing, like, they just really crushed it. Um, fortunately someone got laid off because of COVID with the Boeing, but what up Mike? Uh, TikTok is full of snowflakes though. It's hundred percent truth Thaddeo, And that's why I avoided it for so long. And that's why I constantly am pushing everyone towards like YouTube for like the deeper content. However, I figured this, if you can't beat them, you got to join them. There's just no way you're going to beat the people that are like flaunting off GameStop and, um, you know, buy this penny stock and become a millionaire tomorrow, you know, buy this, uh, course on selling, uh, things on Amazon and we're gonna make a new millionaire tomorrow. You just need one product and you're gonna, like, it's like, printing money, uh, start real estate without any experience, no money, no connections, no license. Like that's still stupid. And so it's TikTok is full of that garbage. And so my opinion is, look, I'm going to try to like do a little tiny bit to do counteract, counteract that. And hopefully one or two people listen and it keeps them from going down a road. That's going to really be damaging them by starting a business when they're not an entrepreneur and they're going to really mess themselves up mentally, or they're constantly comparing themselves to people who are on the finish line, way down the road. And then you realize that they're not there. They're just getting started. They're the first and second inning of a very long game. It's not easy. Um, and so I hope I can shed a little bit of light on that. Mike, we struggle with raising prices and some of our first clients from when we started, do you think it's worth keeping them at a lower price because they help grow our business? No, 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 no. I have never, ever, how do landscaper raise the prices on their mowing clients and then regret it ever, 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 ever. I've no, I've never had someone like, man, Mike, I raised those prices. I don't know if I should have done that. I think it was just too soon. Never in all my years, which is not that many, let's be honest. Um, have I ever heard someone say that we raised prices many times at Augusta. We raised it, them twice in 2020. Cause like we talked about inflation. It's going up all the time. 
Don't think inflation isn't going up. Don't think your cost of labor is going up. Don't think your, your fuel is not going to be going up in price and materials and all the rest of it. You need to be raising your prices and you need to be able to raise your prices on the people you had for five years, 10 years, whatever. They're the ones you need to raise first. And if you're going to get concerned about who is it, oh, Mr. Jones, he's nice. He always gives us a snapple when we go over to his property. He gives me a Diet Coke. Diet Coke's my favorite drink. If that's your problem, you literally need to sit down, print off a sheet without their names and blindly increase their prices. Then send them all emails and just do it blindly. I don't care if it's not in, if it's not accurate perfectly. If some of them are actually good, making good money, if you just need to blindly raise your prices, do it. Um, especially when you're small, you can get wrapped up in the whole emotion. Like they were my first one. <laughs> they were my first customer 24 years ago. I'm still only charging them $12, but they were my first customer. Who cares? We're here to make money people. All right. Your employees, they, they need a paycheck and they're going to make more tomorrow. We need to be increasing our prices. Guess what? If you're on P4P, your employees do not want to be running a charity organization by getting less budget hours on a job. Raise the price. Give them more time on the property with budget hours. Give the employees more money. Yes, Lee. Mike's going to be dancing soon on TikTok. I'm the most uncoordinated dancer. Never danced my whole life. It would be an ugly sight. I'll tell you that. So when you say booked out two weeks, what do you mean? Because I have two employees right now, and technically I'm booked out through end of fall since everything is recurring. Yeah, Hunter, so that's when you ask yourself, do you want to grow? Because if you do, I can almost guarantee you, you'd go hire someone right now and in two weeks have work booked out for them too. Maybe you get some cleanups, maybe you sell some more mowing jobs, but if you're booked all the way through the end of fall, there's just no way that you're getting more customers because you're just telling them, hey, we're booked out, we don't have enough space in our calendar, or if there's cleanups, sorry, we don't have any time. That's the, the work that can be done by that next employee that can and really grow the business. Ray Bowman, that customer acquisition cost would be more because of the labor cost to pass out the flyers. Even as the owner, your labor counts. That's true, Ray. But this is effective. When I'm, when I'm talking about this, this is the effective amount you're paying like cash. So I'm assuming, yes, the owner is working. And yes, you could assume, okay, plus, you know, if this took three hours at 20, 20, then we're looking at like $85 customer acquisition cost. Yes, you're 100% correct. I agree with that 100%. However, when you're first getting started, there's no alternative. It's not, you're not, you don't have the work to go do. This is what my, I'm assuming here. If I don't have the work to go do, I should be going and talking to people, knocking on doors, getting dirty, you know, putting your foot in the trenches and let's roll. Pound the pavement. Let's roll. You know? So I get you're saying though, you are right, Ray, um, in terms of, especially down the road when you're comparing customer acquisition costs. Um, but I'm assuming here that there is no alternative for you to go be doing work and making money. Also signed up for service all pot today. Told them Mike sent me. Thank you, Alex. Um, I don't get anything for that, but <laughs> any advice on finding property to rent out for our trucks, equipment, and mulch beds? We are in the suburb of Boston, so customers are easy to find, but land isn't. I've talked to local companies, but it seems most guys just store their stuff in their driveway. Where do you recommend? Do I find space? Honestly, this is, this is a tough one. Uh, get to know your area. Try to find a residential homeowner that has like four or five acres or a, a farm, even better yet. We have tons of acreage and they don't mind giving you a little bit of property and they're like thrilled that they get five, $600 a month. Uh, and maybe it's not zoned perfectly for it, but you're basically using it as storage. And as long as, uh, you know, it's somewhat secure and not like on a busy street, you're probably not going to like called out for it. When you're small, you can get away with that. I would recommend you look at the, um, video I made for the Mount Vernon location like a year ago. You can see our property. You can see how we did it. Got it for like 300 bucks a month. It's very rare that it's that cheap, but uh, all our corporately owned locations, that's what we try to do. We try to find those residential areas or even sometimes commercial, but areas that we can just rent for parking. Gus the Lawn Care of Southside. Alistair, you're killing it over there, man. You're crushing it. Richard, do you think you could do something as a stress test to get ready for the business stress management or to better jump right in? Uh, Richard, if you are in a corporate position, what I would recommend is trying to get as close to the sun as possible. What I mean by that is try to get the heat of ownership without actually being the owner. That means how can I support the owner? How can I get as close to them as possible? See what they're feeling, you know, get their thought process on things, whether it be just showing up at the meetings for free. Like, Hey, I don't want to get paid. I'm just going to show up to this meeting with you. If I can just sit here and listen, that'd be fine. The closer you can get to the sun, the more heat you get without actually being thrown into the fire. Right. So that's what I, my recommendation is for anyone that wants to kind of warm up their entrepreneurial spirit uh, and skill set without actually having this, the risk, like we talked about at the beginning, uh, definitely get as close to the sun as possible. The owner, whether you're in a five person business or 50 person business or 500 person, how can you get to the executive? How can you, how can you get closer to your manager? 
and learn what they're learning uh, and get slowly to the point where you're actually learning from the owner themselves, that would be my recommendation. And if you got to do it for free, if you got to do a free internship, whatever it is, like I would do a free internship. I would drop everything I'm doing right now. If Elon Musk called me and said, I want you to be my personal assistant and you're with me like literally 16 hours a day while I'm working, I would drop everything I'm doing right now. Everything I would, because that experience would be invaluable to me and the people I could help from gaining that inf information. Um, like that's, that's what you have to think about as an employee. I couldn't do that because it would kill me to be an employee at all. But in general, like that, that thought process of, of ownership before actually having something of your own is get as close to the sun as possible. Get as close to the most successful person you know. How can you get coffee with them? Then how can you work for them? Then how can you do something free for them? How can you get like just as close as possible is what my recommendation would be. Hey Mike, I just gotta say thank you for your tips. I was able to get 10 clients so far and got a combi system today. I'm 16. Good job, brother. Double Brewski, do you think entrepreneurship do you think entrepreneurship is stressful regardless of industry or do you think lawn care is much more stressful? Ask me because I'm thinking of trying something else out. I'm so stressed. Uh, honestly, lawn care is really simple. Um, and yes, there's a lot of facets. Yes, it's dealing with labors, which is not easy. And you're like, oh, well, sure, it's easy for you to say it. Like, no, I am every single day working with our franchisees who are just getting started, our corporately owned locations just getting started, struggling to find people right now struggling to find land, struggling to get your trailers that we've been waiting months for because the supply chain's backed up. Like these are, these are tough issues, but in general, lawn care is pretty simple compared to a lot of other industries that are much, much more difficult, changing much at a much more rapid pace because of technology. Like if you think, you know, lawn care is changing quickly with the labor industry, you should check out, check out retail. You should check out online e-commerce. Like they've got to be changing every day dramatically their whole business model in the past 12 months. So in my opinion, um, learn the stuff of lawn care now, learn and hone your skills of hiring, management, scheduling, uh, you know, marketing, all these things, branding, learn that stuff now, and then go do something that you're more interested in possibly down the road. But do not think changing industries is going to solve your problems. Most business uh, fundamentals are the same across. They're universal. That's why you can put an incredible operator, incredible business owner in one business, switch them in different industries, and they still do good. You can take another person, they don't do really well in the industry, they're like, oh, like this one they're better at. Oh, they don't do good. There's a certain level of you know, the ability to be able to grind, to be able to lead people that's universal, to be able to marketing, universal, sales. It's all, many of these concepts are universal, whether you're in lawn care, technology, retail, manufacturing, warehousing, supply chain stuff, like it does not matter. A lot of these things are very fundamentally the same uh, in terms of growing a business. All right, here we go. I got to wrap this up. I have 2008 F-150 XL 5.4 Triton engine. What's the largest dump trailer I can buy without putting too much stress on the truck? I wouldn't get more than a 5x10 dump trailer, uh, maybe a 6x12 depending on your truck, um, but I, we like to stick to the 5x10s just to confirm that we can actually pull it with a half-ton pickup. That being said, we do have a 6x12 on some of our 150s, but otherwise you got to go to like a three-quarter ton or a full ton if you're going to start pulling like a 7x14 or bigger. We have a dump truck for cleanups, but no leaf back. We are getting one before this fall, but for now, just using tarps. Any recommendations for speeding up our cleanups? Yeah, in the back of a pickup, oh, you have dump trailers? You have dump trailers? You have, you have a dump truck, that's great. If you don't have a dump truck or a dump trailer, I would recommend those tarp systems that you can roll off the back of your bed or your truck. You throw the tarp down, it has a, a rolly, rolly thing, pulley on the back of your bed, and then you throw all your leaves on the top of the tarp, and then you roll it off really, really slick if you don't have a dump trailer, etc. We found a hardscaper construction who is trying to, to offset his expenses and is renting a portion of his space out to us and is taking care of the debris. Yep, Chuck found a great spot in Mooresville. Um, there's other options like uh, roofers, con contractors in general, concrete, guys who have concrete businesses usually have a lot of space to dump and they're dumping like gravel and concrete chunks so they don't really care if you're you know, digging or you're dumping uh, like grass clippings and branches because they're burying a lot of this stuff anyways. My trailers aren't supposed to be here until August now. What should I do? Honestly, what I would do is ask your supplier, if, hey, if I can change the color, if I can take a different size, like what trailer can you give me? This is something we're dealing with in New York right now, like literally as we speak. Hey, Mike, what's the best way to organize your clients? Because you have such a, a huge franchise and so many clients. You need to have a good CRM, and then you need to make sure you stay in touch with those clients all the time. Which, by the way, I got to back to my last, uh, my last, q and I made a mistake. I misread a question and I said it was only for the franchisees because I misread the question. 
Um, let me just clarify something. So the question was, I forget, I'm blanking on his name. I'm sorry. Uh, he doesn't live even far from here. Mark, Mark is his name. Uh, he asked a question about what our follow-up process, what our emails look like for when we follow up after an estimate. We send out emails on day one, two, three, and then on fifth day we call them. And then if after that there's no response, we mark it as lost. And basically we're tacking price in the first email because that's what everyone thinks about. The second one is generally like, hey, just making sure you got this. Anything you want to change, we work within your budget. Day three is when can we get on the schedule and we're actually offering times. And then day five, we're actually calling them in person. So uh, I just misread the question. I said, oh, that's only for the franchisees. Um, I obviously can't share the templates, but I can at least share that part. So I apologize for that. Um, yeah, Edward, a service all is pretty confusing, honestly. Um, yeah, more info on that coming out later. Thaddeo, what would be a good balance between profitability and momentum when starting out, Mike? Low prices to get customers or better profits but slower growth. Goal is to grow as quick as possible. If your goal is to grow as quick as possible, you're going to lower your prices in order to get the momentum and book yourself out two or three weeks so you can go hire your next guy, get your next truck, et cetera. That momentum, eventually you start raising your prices. It slows the momentum down, but now you've got so much you know, momentum behind you, the ball keeps turning, right? So again, when we train our franchisees, we have the different stages of growth and the first couple stages of growth, we recommend they actually keep their prices lower in order to make sure their close ratio is 60, 70 plus percent. If your percentage is lower than that, you're gonna be lower growth. Therefore, you might have higher profits, but you're not gonna grow as quickly. So if your goal is to grow, I would make sure you're not charging things like dump fees or e-fees and things like that. I would not reduce your budget hours. Like on a five hour cleanup, I would not put three I would try first to cut your costs on the material markup and other fees you're charging in order to get momentum. This is not a long-term strategy. Everyone knows I like to keep prices high, charge a premium product, have higher margins, but definitely when you're first getting started, getting that momentum is really important and I'm willing for you to lower your prices at the beginning. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and jump off here. I know a lot of you have different questions. I will try to get to these maybe in the next session. Thank you so much for watching. Comment below uh, and share this if you, if you know someone's just getting started in entrepreneurship. They're just going to start in a small business. They're thinking about it or you, you know, they, you know that they're kind of being pulled by the whole social media. Like they jump from thing to thing. A lot of times the reason people jump from thing to thing is they basically keep, you got to go back to the beginning of, of when I drew, drew the graph, but what they're doing is they just keep restarting their entrepreneurial journey at the bottom here. And they never are patient enough to see what we talked about. And that is the, the growth at year three, four, five and beyond. So hope that was helpful. I'm Mike Andes, landscapebusinesscourse.com. We'll see you on the next video.